Shalom, shalom, everybody. Ariel Bart Sadok here from the Kosher Torah School, found online at www.koshertorah.com. Ah, it is time to talk about very interesting topics, which you might have thought were a little bit beyond us, but I'm going to show you really not. What am I talking about? What most people today would call the Maaseh, Merkava, or the secrets of ascent. Putting things into a context. This is the week of the holiday Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We've been counting down Omer now since Pesach. We're coming to the 50th day. And in our traditions today, this is the time that we commemorate Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Now, with that being said, that is the direction in which we're going to go. However, before we go there, let's just take a couple of little detours along the way. Number one, biblically speaking, the Hag Shavuot, the Hag of, of the weeks, was actually, biblically, in the times of the temple, the time for celebrating the first fruits. This was the Hag Bukurim. The time when the first harvest would come due and you'd bring your stuff to God. Well, I think that is something that we should all commemorate at all times. Look, in spite of however hard things have been for a lot of us, a lot of people I know, you know, have gone through this, this time period just dating us now. It's, uh, again, Erev Shavuot 2020. A lot of people have not been able to work. A lot of people have been forced out of employment by government authority, lockdowns, close downs and the like. It's been a rough time financially, emotionally, psychologically. I get it. But you know something? Wise old words, I'm sure everybody knows. This too will pass. We will recover. We will overcome. In the Sefer Yetzirah daily classes that I'm doing now, available on YouTube, Facebook, and Patreon, I always give a little 30-second blurb right at the beginning, telling everybody the importance of looking for opportunity within every obstacle. And that this is a very important concept. The Sefi Yitzirah puts it into a, of course, Sefi Yitzirah language. It says permutate letters. But what are you permutating letters for? All right, there's no magic. Sefi Yitzirah wasn't written by Ms. Rowlings. It is not part of the Harry Potter series. It's not magic. It's a spiritual technology. Go check those lessons out and see for yourselves. As you will do that, you will recognize the power of formation, Yitzira, that's in our hands. We can form, we can create all kinds of things that are underlying the physical reality in which we live. And that's what's important to understand. So, when it comes to performance, that's right, performing, deeds, doing things, all of Judaism is built upon a psychological-spiritual-angelic-psychic concept. We all know we are communicating ourselves right now through verbal language. I am speaking words, and you are understanding them. Now, the words that I'm speaking at this time are presently in the English language. I'm sure that we have the ability, whether it be through text or other means, to translate what I am saying into almost any human language that we are aware of. I personally confess I do not know of the technology at this time, but I will Bet you dollars to donuts, the day will come with a click of a button. You will be able to listen to any speaker in any language, translated into the language that you yourselves hear. That is a, believe it or not, Sefer Yetzirah technique of permutation, changing one set of sounds to another so as to allow the communication of the inner essence within them. Very, very important to understand. The same concept 
with regards to our many different religious beliefs. I am honored and proud here at our Kosher Torah School that we have people from all walks of life, all faiths. You're overly, honestly, sincerely welcome. The only people you should know that I do not welcome to our school are provocateurs and those that seek to subvert, cause strife, chaos. Them? <laughs> Let them go away. I don't want them. <laughs> all right? We're here to build bridges, not burn them. Sebi Yitzira is all about that. Judaism is all about that. So what language is Judaism? Oh, oh that's right. Hebrew. No. Judaism is not Hebrew. The original language of the Israelite people and the books of the Israelite the nation, the Bible, those are Hebrew. But Judaism, as every Jew will tell you, has transcended all languages. Look at those of Eastern Europe. Their tongue is Yiddish. Those of Spanish extract, Ladino. Those of Western American extract, English. Others, Arabic. Others, Amharic. All these different languages, right? But these are still human languages. But what unites us all, right? The one rule that unites us all. And the answer to that is the psychic language, the angelic tongue. The angelic tongue, that's, a, that's actually a contradiction in terms because do angels actually speak and have an, a, a verbal language? I'm going to reveal you a secret. Yes, they do. Especially the Tilly. If and when certain people have certain visions, most visions are visual. Uh, you know, that's the way the Torah was received at Mount Sinai. We'll get into that. That is the way, if you remember from the Torah, the Bible itself, God says he speaks to prophets in dreams and visions. The language of the angels, for the most part, the language of the yet seratic fourth dimensional reality, for the most part, is visual. And therefore, the projection or communication, instead of in this words or that, is always in the form of imagery. So that is why, especially Rambam Maimonides got this right in his More Nebuchim, that the whole purpose of all the commandments that we do, here we are giving a sacrifice to God for the first fruits. We're saying thank you, right? No, don't go around slaughtering animals and stuff like that. We've, we've outgrown that. Really? Yeah, that's what Rambam says. So I'm, I'm, I'm in good standing with that. And I agree with him on that. And yes, I am of the opinion that when the third Beit HaMikdash, the real one, uh, according to the Gemara, the Zohar, comes down from heaven fully built, what that means? I don't know, but if it's not of this earth, we got that no nasty word. We got to apply to it. It is extraterrestrial. Hey, it's not of this earth. That's what it is. I don't make this stuff up. Don't go yelling and screaming at me. Now you say, oh, it's all symbolic. Maybe it is. I guess we'll find out when the time comes. But now, getting back to imagery, picture. Look behind me. You see on my wall, I have all these shivitis and stuff like that, with all these prayers and all that. Well, I don't actually take them down and read them. I don't really have to. They're meant as visualization devices. When Rambam says to us the purpose of the mitzvot were specifically and intentionally focused towards one specific goal, and that is the removal of idolatry. Now, what does that mean, the removal of idolatry? It's real easy to remove a physical form, all right? Take a little statue, bow down before it. Oh, it's an idol. Take it, smash it. <laughs> idol gone, right? Wrong. We all know this very clearly from the Bible itself. You all remember the famous story of the 12 spies and how they, 10 out of the 12, cried and bewailed, oh, we can't take the land. It's too big. It's too terrible. It's too this. And they shrunk themselves before an aggrandized image in their minds. You learn from that a very important lesson, which is you can take the people out of Egypt but you can't necessarily take Egypt out of the people. Very profound 
message for us to this day. Well, this is what Maimonides is talking about with regards to the observance of the commandments. Everything that we do was focused to teach us, to wean us off of the idolatry psyche, the idolatry state of mind, where in which we do not, because we do not know how, to focus, to experience the reality of the unity of God. Let me digress again for a minute here. Right before this class, the Rabbanita and I were sitting here it is uh, the Memorial Day Monday, and we said, what do we want to do today? And we said, let's just go for a drive. And I said, I know where I'm going to take you. And we drove all the way down out of Knoxville through Merrillville, went straight out east into Smoky Mountains National Park, out by Cape Cove. Now, if you don't know that area, Google it. Take a look at some of the imagery. And the place is just so stunningly beautiful. Today was the perfect date to go. We found this secluded area by one of the streams, beautiful running water. It was lovely. It was gorgeous. And the first things that came to my mind was Kiddusha. No, not holiness. The Kiddusha prayer, where in which we recite, holy, holy, holy. It's Hashem of hosts, right? The whole world is full of his kavod. The whole world is full of God's energy the true energy of power of his presence. We call that the divine presence or the Shekhinah. Oh, we're going to get all into Shekhinah stuff as we proceed into our practical meditations for a for tonight, uh, Shavuot night. So, understand now, the reason why I'm telling you that is to create within you a context of an image, a thought, and a, something that you can visualize about the beauty of nature, the calmness, the wonder, experiencing the beauty that the power of the divine puts in the natural world, that the divine materializes. So, that is what we're supposed to be learning by observing the commandments. When we focus on what the commandments actually and really mean, then they become transformational archetypes which enable us psychic and spiritual and psychological emancipation. They allow us to, if you will, get out of Egypt. Remember, Egypt today is as much a living metaphor as it was a historical reality in the olden day. And that's what we have to recognize, because in all due respect, Many of us today, the way that we look at religion, the way that we practice religion, what we hold in high esteem versus what we disrespect, if you look at it and analyze it, you would be stunned and surprised how many of us are embracing the psychology of idolatry, even if we are not performing the actual physical form of it by the worship and you know of any specific idol or, or you know false religion by Jewish standards. That's a problem. It really, really is a problem. And it underlies what uh, many a rabbi have asked for what thousands of years. How come Mashiach hasn't come? And the answer why the Messiah hasn't come is because you have to recognize and understand what the in quote coming of the Messiah is. In the Christian tradition, well, our brothers and sisters are looking for a cosmic event where in which you're going to have the ultimate war between good and evil and uh, the, the Antichrist takes over and then, of course, there Yeshu uh, comes out of, a, out of the sky on a, on a white horse with an army of angels singing the old Mighty Mouse song, Here I Come to Save the Day. Cool and groovy. If that's going to happen, so let it be. But they've been waiting for as long as we have. All right? Our brother and sister Muslims have been waiting for al Mahdi. Everybody's waiting for everybody. <laughs> Nothing seems to be happening. The Baal Shem Tov, brilliant man, taught in the same spirit as Maimonides about the importance of the removal of idolatry from our psyche. And he taught 
his own dream, his own vision. Where it states on one Rosh Hashanah, he had an ascent. He did an aliyah. What's that? Well, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to actually teach it to you before the end of our class tonight. And no, it's not a hard, intricate thing. It's a psychological exercise which absolutely every one of us can perform. What's going to come out of it? That's up to you. But the Baal Shem Tov taught me. He said, did this ascent. He sent it above. He sees Mashiach. And he says, you know, uh, dude, we've been waiting for you for a long time. When, when, when are you coming? So Mashiach looked at his watch and says, well, I think next Thursday at 3 o'clock is a good time. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He said, when people around the world are able to make aliyot ascent, just like you're doing right now, he says, that's a good sign to watch for. What does that mean? It means this. When you make Aliyah ascent, psychologically, you are addressing through the language of the higher domains, imagery, how to overcome the limitations of what we can call your inner Egypt. And when you can do that, that brings psychological redemption. And again, the Baal Shem Tov taught very clearly and wisely, each one of us has a spark of the Messiah in us. And when we activate that within ourselves individually, hey, what do you know? Like a positive virus. It goes around the world and doesn't infect, but affects everybody and could turn everything to good. Gee, what do you know? Actually learn from this about, you know, the virus that we're dealing with now. Everybody's not everybody, but at one time, everybody was terrified. Oh, this little itsy bitsy virus is going to kill you. And that's what viruses do. But you know something? There are a gazillion viruses out there that were half of which are probably oblivious to. But learn from the me method of its spread that just like a physical virus can spread, so can a psychic idea spread both good or evil. So we have the potential to actually project positivity into the collective psyche, which can literally spread like a virus. Or, as the Baal Shem Tov said, to activate that spark of Mashiach within each and every one of us. So, Shavuot, Feast of the First Fruits. You know what's the best thing you can do for this day? Find someone or some cause that's in actual and sincere need. Not some big organization that needs you to, to pay for them if they're not doing things for themselves. Someone who really needs stuff, right? Look around. Friends, family, neighbors. If you want to choose an institution or an organization, find one that really needs help. I mean, sincerely, and that it's something that you actually and sincerely support. Not just to make yourself look good. Not just to get a tax deduction. And give. Provide. Help. Yes, according to halakha law, we're supposed to give a tzedakah, a charity of 10%. You know something? I don't care if it's 10%, 11%, or even 20%. Give and give thanks to God that you're able to give. Give thanks to God that you have what to give. And even though you don't, you know what? God will provide. God will provide. And that's the most important thing. That's step one, in my opinion, of the best way to observe Shavuot. I bet you don't hear your other rabbis talking about this. But that's the start. With that being said, let's jump ahead. During biblical times, Matan Torah was one thing, but the Korim was, was the big deal of, of Shavuot. But now, judging from the Bible, Torah story, we know this is the time of Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Now, please understand, when we come to approach God, let's just set down some very important principles. God is not your fairy godfather. He is not your sweetie loving grandpa. God 
is not the one who's going to say, oh, come here, little boy chick. Oh, come here, little girl chick. Let me give you a little hug and a blah, blah, blah. All right? Remember what happened at Mount Sinai. They had to make a big circle around the mountain. They said, anybody who violates that principle dies. What happened to my loving, sweet daddy in heaven? Okay. Let's talk about Mount Sinai. Let's get real. We believe in our faith that, of course, the story at Mount Sinai is real. Yes, there are a lot of people who say, oh, it's legend. It never really happened. Okay, you know, something, whatever. There's no actual proof. So, because there's no actual historical proof, that is historical proof that it never happened, that type of logic is insulting and every rationalist and intellectual will dismiss it out of hand. The lack of proof is not proof of lack. Okay, so for those who want to say Sinai is this or that other than what it says, good for you. You may not be interested in the rest of this class. But then again, you might. Because I'm not here to address Sinai as a, a, an event in history. I'm here to address it as a psychic event in the realm of thought and mind, which means that it is a living event a constant event that is happening even right now. So, biblical times. They had to cordon it off. Moses goes up. You know the story. You've read it a hundred times. But something very weird happened. Historically speaking, something very, very extraterrestrial, yeah, you got to use the word and don't be afraid of it, happened at Mount Sinai. It was a close encounter of whatever kind you want to say. That was the biggest, most baddest, the most influential moment probably of all human history. Think about it. The Ten Commandments, completely direct, the giving of the Torah, completely set the course for Israel and the Israelite people, which completely set the course for one of our sons, wavered or not, Yeshu, and those who followed him, Christianity. And also set the course for our brothers and sisters, our cousins, Ishmael, Islam. And what percentage of the world today has its foundation in one of our three religions? <laughs> Think about that. You want to go even further? You go look at the history or the migration of ideas and thought. We don't have all those records. But you're going to read certain things in Chinese literature, Buddhist or Hindu literature, that's going to make you stroke your beard, even if you don't have one, saying, gee, that sounds awfully familiar. Most of us today do not know what the original Torah taught. We know the Torah as we have it today in the form of Orthodox Judaism. That's all well and good. But Orthodox Judaism is our form, our practice. And anybody who knows their history knows there were other forms, earlier forms, most of which that have fallen by the wayside and are insignificant and not relevant to us today. But we have, well, forget the modern forms like the Reform, the Conservative in the Western tradition. They pretty much contradict the foundations of what Judaism is really, or Torah Judaism is about. When you deny the authenticity of Torah and mitzvot, like many of these groups do, well, they've done what they've done. But let's talk about other groups. Let's talk about groups like the Karaites. They are not rabbinic like us, but they hold by the Torah in their own faithfulness. They're still there. They're around. Do we agree with them? No. But they still consider themselves Israel. Are they? They say they are. We may or may not say it doesn't matter. They still cling to a tradition, but they're not older than the rabbinic. But take a look at the community of Beta Israel, which came out of Ethiopia. They are older than the rabbinic tradition. Does that make them more authentic? No, it just makes them different. Who the heck throws it? Or what does the word authentic mean? Right? You accept this, they accept that. That's 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 authentic. But the Beta Israel, for example. They will still embrace books like Yobalim, Jubilees, and Hanoch, Enoch, and the like. Fine. 
if that community is going to interact with the rabbinic community, bridges have and had been made, and that's fine too. But recognize and know the nature of communities, the nature of ideas. In our rabbinic tradition, we have ancient, ancient ideas that many modern people aren't even aware of. And I'm talking about the ideas of, say, the Merkava tradition, the continuation of the prophetic tradition passed down by the biblical prophets. So, on this day of Shavuot, we have a merging of ideas and concepts. Mount Sinai, something definitely happened there. All right? Moses receives the Torah on Mount Sinai. God, it says, spoke to the people. Maimonides says something very, very cool. He says, based upon what the Bible says, that the people saw the voices. How do you see a voice? All right? Do you see something popping out of my mouth now as I'm speaking? Yeah, I know. We can make the graphics on the video make it happen like that. But it's Mount Sinai, not modern day technology, social media. So what did they see? Maimonides says something very profound. That they all heard that voice of God. That's that shofar sound growing louder and louder and louder. The contradiction or the opposite of what it would be normal for us. You have a loud, you have a shofar. You know what a shofar sounds like, right? Woo! And then as the breath dies down, it goes until it goes out. This one's going louder and louder. Ooh. Like a hum, a pitch. That was the voice. And the people all physically heard the voice. But it says that the word of God was then seen in their minds. That only inside was that sound of a voice broken up into individual words that the people could comprehend. So if you have some communication which is coming through some imagery, remember seeing the words, and it's only communicated and received and understood in the mind, we've got a word for that today. We call it telepathic. So whether you like it or not, Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, was a telepathic event. And that makes a lot of sense in light of an old Midrash. There was a Midrash. That states that at Mount Sinai, only the righteous could hear the word of God. As for the wicked, they claim all they heard was thunder. Now that makes sense. Because the hearing isn't physical. It's not like you're hearing a voice speaking words on a microphone speaking down from the mountain. I am the Lord your God. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Nah. Oh, and the vibration, and the people were transfixed. The Midrash says that they literally died when they heard, because the input of that telepathic reception was so overwhelming that it probably short-circuited the physiology. All right, that was an intense experience. Now, in my personal opinion, I confess, I have no physical source that I can point to to validate this, but this is my opinion based on my own visions and experiences. I think that that voice, that sound, which imprinted itself on the minds of the individuals who were there at Sinai, somehow either marked or changed those individuals at a genetic DNA level. And that that was God's marker. And intentionally that these people would spread around the world with the, in quote, programming of Torah inside their genes that they could pass on. And that it was from that moment in that place that all wisdom and understanding of the unity, building the bridges, came to the world. And from that blossomed into all the different forms that we have today in what in Kabbalah we call the exile of the Torah. That the Torah takes on all different ways and forms, but it's all, again, coming back to the singular source. That is the Torah of Mashiach. And when we make ascent 
That is what we experience. So when it comes to the observance of the holiday of Shavuot in accordance to the rituals of Judaism, you can open up any of the books of law codes and find the variety of the different ways and means of how to do things. That's all well and good. If you are of a Torah observant path and you want to learn the laws of Yom Tov itself, then again, there, there are books out there. Go look at what is permissible, what is not permissible. You don't need me to tell you that because that's not our purpose here. You got many of my other great peers out there whose focus is on halakha. We focus here on Kabbalah, the inner as opposed to the outer. If you so choose to observe one of the popular rituals of the time to eat dairy for a meal, according to Kabbalistic tradition, the proper time to do that or to have a non-meat meal would be the first night of the holiday because following, therefore, we're going to be performing meditations and you want to be light in your stomach. You don't want to be weighed down. It's going to you know, knock you out, put you to sleep or dull in your mind. So you eat light, livening, enlightening foods as opposed to anything else. Um, all the other details with stuff, fine. Know this. Obviously, the Torah portion that is read on Shavuot is the Ten Commandments. But the Haftarah, which is the prophetic portion, is the first chapter of Ezekiel and the Maaseh Merkava. And what is the connection? The connection is this. Ezekiel and the prophets ascend, but at Mount Sinai something descended, came down. We go up astrally, on Sinai, something came down tangibly. This is why we say about Moses that he was the hot, you know, number one prophet of them all. Because Moses, his experiences was an actual, tangible, close encounter. The Midrash teaches that when Moses had it later, you know, go up to heaven to receive the, the commandments and, and stuff like that, it says a cloud comes down upon the mountain. Moses looks at the cloud. What, what do I do with the cloud? Right? Do I do I do I you know walk into it? Do I do I sit? Do I what 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 do I do? It says a door opened in the cloud. Moses goes in and then the door closes. Cloud goes up. I don't know about you, all right? I'm limited in my experience, but I've never to this day seen a cloud that has a door in it. <laughs> if you see clouds with doors, please let me know. Something weird happened. Now these are stories you're going to tell me. Yeah, but you know when you have story after story after story and everything's pointing in a direction, again, you got to stroke your beard whether or not you have one going, you know, something weird's going on here. All right? The truth is out there, Fox Mulder would tell you. Sinai was an extraterrestrial event. Somehow, somehow, some way, something big happened. Now, it's important that I emphasize this because extraterrestrial, what we call spiritual, is actually one and the same. Which means that it exists in a dimensional plane of reality different from our own. You and I think in like points, okay? There is a point in time and a point in space. And it's way, way, way back then. And we are far away from it. Well, in our three-dimensional cube of reality, that may be true. But we're dealing with a fourth and a fifth dimensional reality, where in which the lines that demarcate and differentiate space and time are very blurry. They can be tapped by what we call the fifth dimension. No, I don't mean the rock and roll band from the 60s, even though I remember them. Okay? The fifth dimension is mind. Going to the Sefiyatira course, oh, you really want to learn Sefiyatira. Take the 40-hour course. I don't even advertise it. Right? It's not available on koshertorah.com. You're only going to hear about it word of mouth from me. If you're interested, you send me an email, arielsedo, gmail.com. I'll tell you all about it, but it's a big investment. All right? Not just money-wise, but in yourself. You say you want to do stuff. Well, as we say in the words of prayer, Baruch Shamar, we say, Baruch HaOmer Ve'osei. Blessed be the one who says and does. Getting back. When it comes to understanding the nature of what happened at Sinai, 
Something weird happened there. Moses was in contact with something tangible mm -hmm. and physical. But that never happened again, now, did it? Angels, they're popping in and they're popping out. We read about all their stories. Maimonides is the one who will say those angels were all non-corporeal because Maimonides says they were all astral projections. That's how he understood it. He was of the prophetic school. He understood. People think that Maimonides was this master rationalist. He wasn't a Kabbalist in the light of Zoharic and later Kabbalah. But he understood the ancient prophetic school, and many of the rabbis over the generations, the centuries, have recognized this. So you look to Rambam and the Guide to the Perplexed, and we have to, I have an entire class on prophecy from the Guide to the Perplexed. Go on our course page and check it out. Moses had an experience which was clearly extraterrestrial, and then changed. It became psychic telepathic. Did that psychic telepathic exist only in the astral plane? Maimonides said yes. Others said absolutely not. They became tangible. You had actual extraterrestrial visitations, such as the two angels who went to Sodom and Gomorrah and blew up the darn place. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of hard. You know, if you remember the whole story there, these two angels came in and they were met by, you know, a group of disgusting human beings who wanted to gang rape them. Remember, just for the record, the in quote sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality. It was violent gang rape. And to this day, I don't know anybody of any sexual orientation that's going to condone or support violent gang rape. <laughs> I don't know anybody. So, okay, let's not go there. But the nature, like the Bible says, Prophecy happens through visions, imagery. Okay? That's how the prophets were. And let's talk about this one guy. He's hanging out, minding his own business. He's over by the river, just like I was like in the Smoky Mountains, stay by my river. All right? And he's in his meditations. And all of a sudden, he looks up. He recognizes he's in a trance. And he says, the heavens were open and he saw. Right? Marot Elohim. He saw the image. And he saw the big chariot. We read all about the chariot. People do not understand the Merkava. My good colleague, my friend, I should say, uh, Eric von Daniken, very controversial chariot of the gods guy. We've chatted about this at the Alien Con conferences. He says, it's a flying saucer. I said, Eric, it wasn't a flying saucer. Sorry. All right? It wasn't a metallic uh, uh, spaceship with little green men with uh, little blasters. Right? They weren't Klingons or Romulans, or or uh, Vorlons, or Shadows, whatever. Choose your science fiction, throw your guys, and it wasn't them. <laughs> but what was it? Oh, it was clearly a psychological, archetypal vision experience. Yeah, and it was. But don't separate the psychological archetype from the internal, actual, extraterrestrial, fourth, fifth dimensional methods of communication. Just like we learn there's body and soul. In the language of the Sefi Yitzira, we say this, the Sefirot and the letters, okay? Understand when, in quote, them, they, them, they, whatever, want to communicate with us. They're really there. But how do you think they talk to us? Obviously, they speak English, right? No, they don't. They speak Hebrew, right? No, they don't. They speak French, Spanish, Jive. What do they speak? They speak angelic. They speak within the context of their dimensional plane, which is imagery and vision. And they will project their images and visions into your or my mind. And as they do that, we interact and experience... And when you learn and understand the nature of what we call lucid dreaming, you're able to interact in your dreams and ask questions and receive insights. So on this day of Shavuot, it is considered auspicious 
that this is the time when that power of mind creates a vortex, a wormhole in thought and consciousness, which transcends the limitation of the points in space and time of our past and brings us to a point above space and time where we can approach the Merkava as it stood on Mount Sinai. So we can time travel in mind through what we call in psychology active imagination. It's the old Abu Lafian technique that Jung adopted, if you will. And we can travel in mind and thought. This is what the Baal Shem Tov and others will call ascent. Aliyah. It's not intensely profound. It's actually rather simple. And I'm going to share with you right now in the time that we have left how to do it. We've got about 20 minutes left. And you know something? It might not even take 20 minutes to explain. Simply because this is not a hard thing. Most people today want things that are complicated and complex. And they say, if it's not complicated and complex, how valuable is it? Remember what the famous Pasuk says. I quote this all the time. The Torah of Hashem is Tamima, which should be translated as simple, Pashut. And that is Mashivat Nafesh, the restoration of your soul. Simplicity. So this is what you do. As you prepare for Lil Shavuot, now, the Zoharic tradition, which came much, much later, thousand years after, after everything, was to stay up all night. If you want to observe the Zoharic tradition and stay up all night, go right ahead. But there's no need to do that. And many people don't. The old prophetic schools don't. Right? We're not observers of the Zoharic tradition. But if you want to observe, knock yourself out. There is something called the Kiryat Mo'ed, which is an order of ritualized recitations for the night of Shavuot, which in the Sephardic traditions, get people, I don't know if this year if anyone's going to gather in the synagogue because of the, our concerns with uh, the, the pandemic. But normally, you'd sit there and you'd read the Ten Commandments. Uh, you'd read pretty much all, all the 613 commandments, excuse me. Midrashim, you'd read the Idarot from the Zohar, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's a very ritualized structure. I think that completely contradicts the necessity of the fluidity of the time. So I'm not a big fan of Kirat Moed, even though that's what a lot of people believe. But on this night, this is how you do it. Okay? I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. You want to experience Sinai, which I believe is a global collective experience, universal, that affects you and I? Well, then you can tap into this as much as anyone else. Don't give me any excuse of, well, I'm not Jewish, or I'm a woman, or I'm a this. Shut up. Up with all the excuses. I'm not trained to meditation. So fine. Follow basic simple steps. It's not hard. Here they are. Eat lightly for the meal of the, the holiday, of which uh, the first night of the holiday. Eat lightly. No, I didn't say don't eat. I said eat lightly. Eat light foods, not heavy foods. If you're going to, if you're imbibers of alcohol, enjoy. Have a beer or a drink or whatever. Just don't get yourself drunk. Keep your mind open. This is the technique of how it's to be done. Finish up with things. Get into a nice quiet space where you can just sit and relax. Oh, I'm going to fall asleep, you're going to say. Well, you know what? Okay, so you fall asleep. But fall asleep with these thoughts. Visualize. Imagine. Okay? Imagine. In whatever form that you wish, imagine that you can now transport yourself back to Mount Sinai. I don't care if you want to imagine opening up a wormhole. I don't care if you want to imagine having a time machine. It doesn't matter if you want to use science fiction or whatever ways and means that you as an individual want to use that's going to help your mind make the experience more real. If you want to image or you feel comfortable visualizing a purple and pink unicorn with wings coming and hopping on your back and flying you back, God bless you. 
If you want to fly on the back of a luck dragon, God bless you. If you want to feel the aliens are going to come in their flying saucer and zap you back there, God, whatever it takes, it doesn't matter. Remember, the focus is on the essence, not on the form that the essence takes. Why? Remember we learned about Sefi Yitzira? Forms always change. Even the experience of the Merkava that Ezekiel saw, he saw something extraterrestrial, very real, but he saw it through the visage of his individual mind. And that took the form of the culture of his environment. Today, when we have experiences of the Merkava, it looks very, very different. And that's the truth of it for those who experience the Merkava today. So you, whatever your form is, time travel, imagine that you yourself are now back at Sinai. And your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to imagine and embellish that imagination as best as you can using whatever form and ways that work best for you as an individual to experience the moment. Read stories about what happened on that night. I don't care if the history or stories. What difference does it make? We're getting you to an essential point and the images that are, it, it, that it's uncovered and it doesn't matter. That's why, I mean, here's the truth. Sinai was an absolute, realistic, vital reality. Whether What its historicity is, is irrelevant. That's like I said, those secular guys want to believe that? It doesn't matter. Your vessel, or this vessel, doesn't matter. Vessels of essence, they all change. We're going to essence. Imagine yourself. Time traveling back to Sinai. If you wish to visualize holy names of God, go for it. Because that becomes your vessel, your tool. On this night, many people will use the 72 triad name of God with all of the 216 angels. They'll go into the prophetic position. They'll go down. They'll recite the whole thing with the chants and everything else and say the Tashkeveva and all this other stuff. Uh, what am I talking about? Go into my class on Jewish meditation, uh, Jewish magic. It's just hoping about the, the, the holy names and their usage. Uh, it's one of the courses, and it's, it's covered there for those who want those details. But that's a way of how you can do this. You, I don't know your background. You might not know Hebrew, so you don't need it. Yeah, you don't need it. That's right. You can go back to Sinai without any Hebrew whatsoever. But I won't see it the way it was. No one but you will see it the way it is. We're not seeking an historical event. We're seeking a psychic reality which permutates and permeates reality. You, in your imagination, close your eyes, sit back in your comfy chair. If you need a nice glass of wine or a little bit of the L'chaim there, fine. Just allow your mind to flow, but focus! I am traveling in time. I'm going back to Sinai. And let me tell you something what's going to happen. Your imagination is going to take on a mind of its own. And you're going to start to see in your imagination all kinds of weird stuff. Gee, where'd that come from? What is that? Pay attention to what's popping up in your head. Because that's the way that they are putting images and thoughts into your mind to communicate with you to get a message to you about something that you need to hear from them. That's how the system works. So, the more and more you practice this, the less quick you will fall asleep. <laughs> the more you will allow your mind to imagine. Again, read material. Let's speak about this. Best thing, if you're going to fall asleep, read this kind of stuff before you go to bed. And allow your mind to be thinking about this as you fall asleep. And even though you think your imagination is exclusively limited to the inside of your brain, it's not. Your imagination is the realm of mind and thought. And only the little itsy bitsy part of that is you. It connects to the higher, greater whole of all. So the minute you open that back door, your imagination is going to tap into the greater collective consciousness. 
Some call that the Akashic Record. And in that, you will be able to travel in space and time at the speed of quantum entanglement, the speed of thought. And you will be at the moment of Sinai, the place of Sinai. As Sinai exists as a living, perennial experience in the universe. And you will be at that conduit, that point of reception of the Torah. And in your mind, in your own way, you will hear not necessarily the same words spoken at Mount Sinai historically, but you will hear something. You will tap into it. Maybe you won't actually physically hear anything. I doubt it's going to hear physically. You're not hearing voices like crazy people. You might or might not see things in your visualization like in a dream. But you may feel deep impressions, thoughts, ideas. Beliefs will arise within you. You know something you might think? Yeah, you know, I'll bet you at Sinai this or that happened. I'll bet you at Sinai somehow, somewhere, something. Because as you think about it, stroking that beard of yours, which you may or may not have, you say, gee whiz, what really happened there? I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. You're going to think about it some more. And you might not have. And you might not be paying attention. And you might daydream. And you might zone out. And all the... What the... I just had this profound insight. Something tells me that. Whatever, whatever, whatever. That is what we call, in Sefi Yitzira language, in prophetic Kabbalah language, Sechil Tinuda. Oscillating consciousness. Moving back and forth. As you become more experienced in more expert in this, then by the focus of your direction, you will be able, in what we call lucid or directed dreaming, ascend. And you can actually intend upon ascending above. And indeed, you might in your dream have a vision of, so let's say, Mashiach. And what's the first thing that a rabbi, a normal person here on earth, is going to ask Mashiach, oh, please settle our arguments, tell us your name, blah, blah, blah. No. A normal rabbi with the pressures and concern of a daily congregation with the trials and tribulations of life, the first emotional, gut-felt interest that an individual of such will have when addressing Mashiach is, hey, you know, we've been waiting for the world, you know, to become a better place forever. We're waiting for you. When are you coming? What's going on? That wasn't an intellectual question of the Baal Shem Tov. That was a dream question from his gut and his heart. Because in that psychic realm of the higher dimension, they're interested in your intellect. They look at your heart. They look at your energy. They look at your psychic reality. And that is how they communicate with you. So, the whole purpose of the Torah is to remove from us idolatry. Meaning, anything that disconnects us from or distances us from that inner psychic reality of communion and connection of knowing the heart. Like it says, you know, Shema Yisrael stuff, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The words I command you all your upon your heart, you know, that that's Lev, you know, Lamed Bet, the 32 wonders, paths of the, you know, wisdom and stuff like that. Okay, cool. But understand that this is not an intense, involved, complicated system that you have to learn. You don't need to get a PhD in Hebrew and meditative technique. All you got to do is just let go. All you got to do is imagine in a focused direction. As you're sitting there meditating or sleeping or whatever you're going to do, just say, I want to go to Sinai. I want to go to Sinai. I want to go to Sinai. <laughs> Remember good old Dorothy, all right, from Kansas? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. So, Click your ruby slippers three times and say, there's no place like Sinai. There's no place like Sinai. There's no place like Sinai. And think Sinai. Your experience in your mind's active imagination of what Sinai is and what it looks like and what's happening there, it's going to be completely different from mine or the third or the fourth persons. That's fine. 
all the imagery that we see is the subjective kalim, vessels of the mind. It's the inner essence that we get to. Remember Mount Sinai? They heard the voice, but they saw the words. So pay attention to the real inner essence. Monitor to your own experience. Now, let me tell you this. There's an old saying I'm sure you've heard. Fruit never falls far from the tree. Your visual experience, remember in your form and imagery, is obviously going to be in the context of your own personal psyche. If you are Jewish, expect to see more Jewish types of imagery. If you are of a different faith, well, I'm expecting that you would probably see images within the context of that faith which you embrace. It's only psychologically normal. That's what we call archetypes or symbols, symbols of the collective unconscious. Like what Carl Jung would say, racial subdivisions of the collective unconscious. Don't be all shaken up by the individual imageries that you as an individual say, oh, that's the truth. That's your truth. Subjective. What we call, in Kabbalah speak, a klipa, or a shell, a husk. It's only a veil of the truth. Get to the essence. And when you experience and know that essence, then you will tap into what we call Torah of the Mashiach. That is the original Torah of Mount Sinai, which Moses brought down with the first tablets. Yeah, it got broken and it was hidden away. But it wasn't taken away. It was just concealed in the second tablets. Second tablets, foundations of the religion of biblical and later rabbinic Judaism, which we observe today. If you're of the Jewish faith and observing Torah, great, you got that. Now it's time to penetrate within. That's the whole secret of things. But penetrating within is not an academic philosophical exercise. It's a spiritual, psychological, psychic, intuitive experience. And that is in your hands to do. So on Shabbat night, just do it. Don't complicate matters. Just find a simple way that works for you. Call upon God and trust and pay attention to what happens. And don't be so quick to dismiss it as nonsense or imagination. Because the language of the angel speaks to you in a language of mind and thought. And we've been taught in this world not to pay attention to mind and thought. Essentially, we've been taught how to ignore angels. I don't consider that a wise course of action. Because we don't hear their voice, or for that matter, the voice of our mother, Mother Nature, the Shekhinah. Well, good old mommy, she can get really pissed. <laughs> and when mommy gets pissed, <laughs> she'll give us a good whack. And the COVID virus is only the smallest of her punches. Pay attention to that. When it comes to approaching the mountain, remember, and do so with trepidation. Do so with awe. Fear, knowing that this is real and you can do it and you can see it and you can know it. So in the wise words of the great sage Hillel, Zil Gamar, go now, do it. Ariel Bart Sadokia, kosherTorahSchool.com If you need any help with any of this stuff, my courses are readily available for you. Check them out on our course page and see for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for anything. Why bother seeing through my eyes when you can learn to see through your own? That is how we bring Mashiach. Have a happy, healthy, blessed, enjoyable hug. Make it real. Make it valuable. Make it unique. God bless you all.